Okay, time to be bored again. So this is part of the R6RS training arc where we read the entire R6RS scheme specification, page by page, paragraph by paragraph, word by word, and we try examples and we try to see if we can get Shea scheme to give different behavior than the spec and all those things. So we're on page two, table of contents. I already talked about the table of contents in another video. I don't want to talk about this one. So let's go ahead and jump all the way to page three. All right. I don't think there's actually any code on page three, so don't really uh, need to get into Emacs and Shea scheme yet. Well, let me try to pump up the font size here. Okay, page three. This is the introduction. We're going to talk about the philosophy of the scheme language. We're going to learn about the philosophy of R6 and so forth. I know that at least some of this text is from earlier versions of um, you know, the scheme's reports. So you know, I think the first sentence was in R5RS verbatim. It may be much older. So let's just go ahead and read it through it. Programming languages should be designed not by piling feature on top of feature, but by removing the weaknesses and restrictions that make additional features appear necessary. That's right. Right on. Scheme demonstrates that a very small number of rules for forming expressions with no restrictions on how they are composed suffice to form a practical and efficient programming language that is flexible enough to support most of the major programming paradigms in use today. Great. Scheme was one of the first programming languages to incorporate first-class procedures, as in the Lambda Calculus, thereby providing the usefulness, proving the usefulness of static scope rules and block structure in a dynamically typed language. Okay, that's kind of a complicated sentence. All right, one of the first programming languages to incorporate first-class procedures, so that means procedures, which you can think as sort of like functions, but in scheme procedures are procedures because they could have effects. It could have mutation and input and output. So they're not technically mathematical functions. You can create procedures that simulate mathematical functions. Okay, so you can have first-class procedures. So that means procedures are first-class objects, just like you might create a list or an, a vector or array of numbers you can also create a list or vector array of procedures. And just like you can return a number from a procedure, you can return a procedure from a procedure. And just like a procedure can take a number as an argument, a procedure in scheme can take a procedure as an argument. So that's, that's all great stuff. So first class objects. And let's see, as in the Lambda Calculus, so that's Alonzo Church's Lambda Calculus. I'm sure we'll talk about that in other videos, but that was from the 1930s. There's a theoretical you know, foundation for uh, Lambda Calculus and, and for Scheme. So Scheme is an extended call-by-value Lambda Calculus. Thereby proving the usefulness of static scope rules Okay, static scoping we talked about last time. So this is, we can tell where variables are bound just by looking at the program code. We don't have to run the program. It's a static property. And block structure in a dynamically typed language. So block structure, you know, you can have nestings. You can have let expressions instead of let expressions. You can have lambdas inside of lambdas. And, you know, there's, there's a structure to the scoping of variables. Not all languages have that. In a dynamically typed language, okay, so Scheme is a strongly typed language. You can't add five to a Boolean, for example, with the build-in addition. You'll get a runtime error. However, it is not a, well, okay, I'll be careful here. I'll make a claim that, and then I'll adjust it. So I will claim it's not a, strongly statically typed language and say, no, it's a strongly dynamically typed language. So it's the runtime typing you get. Now, it depends on your point of view a little bit. Um, so 
the argument has been made that Scheme is, you know, Bob, Bob Harper in particular, I know, has said that Scheme is a statically, strongly statically typed language. It's just unityped. There's only one type, which is the union of all, all the types in Scheme that the, every Scheme program, you know, has that type statically and that, you know, it is statically typed, but it's less expressive uh, in terms of static typing than, say, an ML program. So I understand that point of view, I think. Um, usually people use the term dynamically typed for languages like Scheme. Okay, so you know, we'll just go with that. Uh, just be aware that there is some more commentary about those terms. And keep in mind that it is, Scheme is not an untyped language. So there are untyped languages where you, know, you basically just have strings of bits and well, whatever they mean, whatever they mean, okay. In in, in a CPU, you know, the central processing unit of a microprocessor, for example, you can have untyped things where you just have a bunch of bits, and well, you can do things on the bits. Uh, you want to treat that bit as a number, I triple E floating point number, fine. You want to treat that bit as an integer, two's complement, you know, whatever. Uh, so you just have bits and you can do with them as you want. So, but that's not what scheme is. Scheme is strongly typed. It's dynamically typed. Okay, keep going. Scheme was the first major dialect of Lisp to distinguish procedures from Lambda expressions and symbols to use a single lexical environment for all variables and to evaluate the operator position of a procedure call in the same way as an operand position. Okay, another complicated sentence that has three claims. The first major dialect of Lisp to distinguish procedures from lambda expressions and symbols. Okay, mm, I'm not sure I completely understand uh, this first part of the sentence. But from lambda expressions and symbols. So in Scheme, a procedure is a value and... A lambda expression is an expression and a symbol, you know, you can quote a symbol, you can get a quoted symbol as a value um, and you can quote lambda and you have the symbol lambda and you can have a quoted lambda expression, but those are different from a procedure. You know, uh, normally in scheme, you, the way you think about it is you have some lambda expression and if it's unquoted and it's in a, con, you know, that's in a context that's going to get evaluated and that lambda expression gets evaluated, the value of the lambda expression will be a procedure. All right. Well, we'll get into that more. But, all right, apparently this is the first lisp. Scheme claims to be the first lisp to make this distinction. And I don't quite understand the symbols part. Okay, so there are all sorts of lisps going back to the 1950s many of which I don't know, but they're famously things like Lisp 1.5. And I don't know enough about the history to uh, fully understand this, this part of the sentence. So someone does know, you know, please let me know. All right, second claim. Scheme was the first major Lisp to use a single lexical environment for all variables. Okay, so, so common Lisp is what's called a two Lisp. Scheme is a one Lisp. In common Lisp, I'm no expert in common Lisp, but I've used it some. In common Lisp, there are different namespaces for, let's see if I can get this right, um, for functions versus values, something like that for non-function values. I'm probably not saying this the way a common Lisp expert would. And once again, you can you know, help me out here. Uh, but the point is, in common Lisp, there is a distinction made between the functions or, you know, what would be a procedure and scheme and other objects. And so um, that, whether or not that's a good idea is somewhat debatable. It's more like this is a design decision and has implications with things like macros. And the, the fact that scheme has a more sophisticated need for hygiene 
with the macros, my understanding is tied partly to the fact that it's a one lisp. Everything's in a single namespace. So, you know, in common lisp, my understanding is you could have the same name, say the same variable name, appear globally once to represent a function or a procedure and once to represent, you know, a number like X is defined to be five, X is defined to be a function. I don't know if you can use exactly the same name. I think you can, I don't know. But, but in any case, they, these objects are treated differently. So um, the functions are treated separately from non-function values is my understanding. So anyway, in Scheme, everything's in one namespace. There's not a, a separate namespace for functions. Well, we, we don't treat it any differently in Scheme. So I think that's nice conceptually. It's a simpler design in terms of, you know, you don't have to treat procedures any uh, differently than other objects. However, it does make the macros, um, you know, the, the hygiene for the macros can be um, subtle, those issues. All right, and then what else? Then to evaluate the operator position of a procedure call, in the same way as an operand, operand position. Okay, for this one, I can go ahead and show uh, an example in code. That's probably a best thing to do. So let's uh, start up Shay. All right, make it nice and big. In Shay, a procedure call is going to be represented as parentheses. And so let's, you know, I don't know, let's just add some num uh, some values. Oops, uh, yeah, there we go. All right, so let's add, say, three and four. So that's the syntax for adding three and four. Um, plus is an identifier that's globally bound in the global environment uh, that is bound to a procedure. You can see it's a build-in because it has this name here. A build-in procedure that knows how to add uh, numbers together. Okay, so that that's how it works. Uh, in you know, of course, we can do something more complicated. So we could say we want to add two numbers, and those numbers that we're going to add are going to be the numbers we get from multiplying three by four and by multiplying five by six. Okay, so whatever those result in, we'll add those. And so the scheme evaluation rules in this case would be we have a procedure application. We have a procedure application, by the way, because in the first position after these, the open parens, we don't have a keyword, you know, for like a special form like Lambda. So, all right, that's not a keyword in this position. So we have a procedure application. So the, the rule is we have to, before we can actually, you know, call the plus, uh, the function that's associated with plus, we have to evaluate all of the sub-expressions, all the arguments. So, you know, we have to evaluate um, the sub-expression, which is going to be a multiplication. And, you know, we recursively do this evaluation. So we end up evaluating three and evaluating four. We also evaluate plus, I mean, sorry, times. Okay, so when, when the times gets evaluated, this uh, variable reference gets evaluated, um, that will give us back a procedure that knows how to multiply numbers. In any case, eventually this sub-expression, which is a procedure, will give us, I mean, a procedure application, will give us a 12, okay? And this uh, sub-expression, when that's evaluated, will give us 30, and so then we can add 12 and 30, but remember, because we're in scheme, this plus itself also gets evaluated, so the variable is looked up in, in this case, the global environment to get the procedure that knows how to add things. So importantly, um, this sub-expression gets evaluated just like this argument sub-expression and this ar argument sub-expression. In Scheme, the order of evaluation is not specified, or at least it wasn't in R5. I don't think it is in R6. In Racket, my understanding is that they specify left to right evaluation order, but I don't think R6 specifies that. So certainly in R5, the order of evaluation of the sub-expressions was not specified. All right, 
So now in this case, the fact that the plus gets, you know, this, this variable reference evaluates to a procedure that knows how to add isn't that interesting, but we can make this a little more interesting. So we could say, you know, let's put in, let's create a list containing some operators. Um, I don't know. And let's say we want to take uh, the car of the list. Okay, now we still get 42. So the point is we have in this first position of the procedure application of the outer application, we have this compound expression that's going to get evaluated just like the expressions that are in argument position. Um, so that, that means that scheme has very regular evaluation rules. Okay, so the evaluation rules of scheme, very nice and beautiful. Um, and so it, in, in a way it's very, very simple once you understand how that evaluation works. Important that you do know exactly how it works. So you, know, you evaluate the operator position of a procedure call in the same way as an operand position. So, you know, um, this is the operator position right here. And these are operand positions, expressions in operand position. Now that's what that means. By relying entirely on procedure calls to express iteration, like looping, Scheme emphasized the fact that tail recursive procedure calls are essentially go-tos that pass arguments. Yeah, we'll probably talk about that some more. I've already talked about this a little bit in some videos. Scheme was the first widely used programming language to embrace first-class escape procedures from which all previously known sequential control structures can be synthesized. I think they're talking about call with current continuation or call CC. A subsequent version of Scheme introduced the concept of exact and inexact number objects, an extension of Common Lisp's generic arithmetic. I don't know Common Lisp's generic arithmetic, uh, but I do know the inexact and exact numbers, or sorry, uh, yeah, number objects in Scheme. More recently, Scheme became the first programming language to support hygienic macros, which permit the syntax of a block structured language to be extended in a consistent and reliable manner. Now there are other languages that have scheme style macros uh, that are hygienic and, you know, like Rust has a macro system like that. I think Scala has something. I, I will say that in my experience, other than Racket, which I believe now they consider themselves not exactly a Lisp anymore, or sorry, not, not a scheme. They might still consider themselves a Lisp. I don't know. Um, but other than Racket, which has really pushed the hygienic macros uh, very far, I don't know of any other language that has something exactly like Scheme macro. So they're, they're languages that have macro systems that are inspired by Scheme macros, but I think partly has to do with the simplicity of Scheme syntax and the evaluation rules um, and the single namespace and all that. It's in, the macros seem to work really well in Scheme in a way that uh, maybe they they seem a little clunkier to me in other languages. Just my, you know, outsider opinion because I haven't used hygienic macros in other systems, but I've seen them used. I've talked to people who've been involved in some of the design, and it, you know, it feels complicated compared to a scheme. Now, scheme macros I think do have complexity to them, but the syntax part of it I think is pretty nice. All right, guiding principles. To help guide the standardization effort, the editors have adopted a set of principles presented below. Like the scheme language defined in the revised the fifth R5 RS report on the algorithmic language scheme. By the way, it really bothers me how that five is typeset. Ugh. Anyway. All right, I'll get, get over it. Uh, the language described in this report is intended to allow programmers, I'm sorry, let me, <laughs> that, that five uh, brought me out of the moment. Uh, the language described in this report is intended to allow programmers to read each other's code. Okay, that was the original impetus for these reports is my understanding. And allow development of portable programs that can be executed in any conforming implementations of scheme. Well, in particular, the libraries 
are supposed to allow that for our six. Derive its power from simplicity, a small number of generally useful core syntactic forms and procedures, and no unnecessary restrictions on how they are composed. Now here, got a little bit of a beef with R6. I don't know if this is a reasonable beef or not, and I've never uh, tried to dive into um, you know exactly why they made these decisions. But my understanding is R6RS libraries have to be, you know, in a file, like one, one library is in one file, I believe, sort of like um, how, how it at least used to work in Java for, for uh, classes. And, you know, it's, it's like uh, the libraries are like these static things. You can't generate code that makes a library within the same program. I mean, you could generate scheme code and then call the compiler, you know, you could generate a library and then call the scheme compiler, I guess, to, on the resulting file, but in the same way that you could, you know, kind of do that in any other language. Uh, but as far as I can tell, you can't like on the fly generate a library and then have it integrated. Now, there, there are things like module systems. So in addition to the libraries defined in R6RS, some implementations like Shea Scheme, and I think Racket has a version as well, have module systems. And the module systems in Shea Scheme, the modules can be placed anywhere you can place an expression. So libraries are not expressions, is my understanding. Those are like big chunks. Those are, you know, they have to go in their own file, basically. Uh, but in Shea Scheme, you can have these modules you can place anywhere there's an expression, which is very, you know, you could have them inside of the right-hand side of a let binding or something, wherever you want. Um, and, and, you know, I think those are just regular scheme expressions. You could have a macro expand to them and all those. And I don't think you'd have a macro. You can't have a macro expand to a library, I don't think. Um so whether or not that restriction is necessary or not, to me that felt kind of unschemely, whereas the modules feel, feel schemely. I don't know why they went with libraries instead of modules. It may be that you know different implementations um, had, had something more like libraries. That's an interesting question to me, but uh, to me that was the big kind of wart in terms of something that felt restrictive to me with libraries. Now, maybe my understanding of this is imperfect, probably is, but that really turned me off. Okay. So I like the modules, like the Shea modules. I think those are really cool. Uh, the libraries I find annoying. Allow programs to define new procedures and new hygienic syntactic forms. Okay. Define new procedures. That's fine. Programs to define new procedures. Well, obviously. You know, and then new hygienic syntactic forms. Okay, sure. So this is like, you know, using define and lambda and uh, define syntax. Okay. Support the representation of program source code as data. Okay, so uh, source code as data. Hmm. I'm not exactly sure what that means. So, you know, famously, you can do this sort of thing. Okay, so here's a, a procedure, a lambda expression that evaluates the procedure that squares things, and we can apply that to plus three, four, great. But we can also quote, oh, quote that expression. Now we get back a list, and so I can do things like take the, the catter, you know, get the second element of that list out, and I can, I can even then do something like eval the catter. Okay. And then I get seven. So, you know, there's this idea of code data isomorphism where I can go back and forth. I can quote something. I can quote an expression. So uh, instead of evaluating that expression, I just get back a list representing the expression. And then I can call eval on it. You know, I can play all those sorts of games. Um, so I don't know if that's... What they mean, that's a classic way to do it, but there's also, because of the hygienic macros, this could mean something more than that, but I think that's what they mean. I'm not sure. 
make procedure calls powerful enough to express any form of sequential control and allow programs to perform non-local control operations without the use of global program transformations. Uh, non-local control operations, is that what with uh, call CC? Is that what they mean? Um, or maybe continuation passing style with the procedure calls? You know, I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by some of these things. I, I know enough techniques now with scheme that I can guess. So they just might mean the fact that you can, you know, thread continuations explicitly through your program as procedures and, you know, a continuation passing style type things, you know, even without call CC, you, you can do all that sort of thing, you know? All right. Maybe, maybe they mean something else between this, between being able to thread, you know, continuations and making tell calls and also, um, call CC, certainly you, you can do those things. Allow interesting, purely functional programs to run indefinitely without terminating or running out of memory on finite memory machines. Oh, this is interesting. I don't know if this this part was in uh, R5 or not. Purely functional programs. So Scheme is a multi-paradigm language. Uh, here they're talking about purely functional programs. Interesting. To run indefinitely without terminating or running out of memory on finite memory machines. So that would include at least two features. One would be garbage collection. So if something is not, you know, if you allocate um, some objects, say on the heap with, uh, you know, using Lambda, you know, Lambda expression, you evaluate it, creates a procedure that procedures on the heap usually. Um, and then that could get garbage collected. Also the fact that there has to be uh, support for proper tail calls means that you can have tail recursion that's not going to use an unbounded amount of stack space. So, okay, I guess probably those two features are what are meant. I don't know if there are any other features that are in, that they're thinking of. Allow edu uh, educators to use the language to teach programming effectively at various levels and with a variety of pedagogical approaches. Sure. Uh, I agree with that. And the success of SICP uh, I think is one indication of that. And at Indiana, um, you know, Scheme was taught as the intro language when I was at Indiana. I think they've moved to Racket now, but it's similar sort of thing. Now, Racket has these language levels and teach packs and all this sort of thing. So they've really run with this idea. Um, one, one thing I will say is that I think a lot of people, if they learn Scheme, say, in the first programming class, you know, they, they see schemes like, oh, that's kind of okay as a teaching language, I guess, with a, except for all those weird parentheses, maybe. Um, but I think they often don't get any sense that this actually could be used for very sophisticated programming. I think they see it as like kind of, uh, you know, I guess that's what people, computer scientists in the 70s used or something, you know, no one uses it anymore. Um, it's just kind of weird. I don't know why we aren't using Python or Java or whatever. Um, I guess these people are just out of touch. And also, um, you know, for the intro courses, they're, the students usually, at least at Indiana, for example, and I think with SICP, you know, they, they would see interesting ideas computationally because you have the simple notation for it, but they wouldn't, uh, see more advanced uses of the language. So, you know, playing around with continuations and, you know, the uh, macros and a bunch of the tricks you can use, like uh, the tricks and techniques in software design for flexibility, you know, um, that kind of thing. So students would often come away, in my experience, thinking it is like this toy language just for teaching um, when it's not. It's, you know, so so it's kind of weird it's, it's, it's a very unusual language, I think, in some sense, scheme is, because it's good for teaching and it's good for having a very clear expression of ideas. And it's also good for like extremely complicated problems, okay? I don't know if it's good for things in the middle, but it's good at those two ends. And I don't, I don't know of too many languages that are like that. There are languages that are really good for complicated things, 
but they're usually not very approachable. And there are languages that are very approachable, but they're often not so great at really complicated things. So I don't know. Uh, but but I think uh, Scheme is, is good at both. Uh, allow researchers to use the language to explore the design, implementation, and semantics of programming languages. Yep. So, you know, either small or big versions of Scheme have been used for programming language research for a long time. In addition, this report is intended to allow programmers to create and distribute substantial programs and libraries. For example, implementations of Scheme requests for implementation that run without modification in a variety of Scheme implementations. These SURFIs, Scheme Requests for Implementation, SF, S R F I, um, SR, they pronounce SURFIs. This is the mechanism by which people in the Scheme community that would like to see some feature added to Scheme or at least the Scheme implementations can go about you know, trying to get grassroots support for this, if you will. So if you uh, want, would like Scheme implementations to support some neat thing, or a neat library or threads or, you know, type of list uh, comprehensions, whatever it is, uh, you can write a Scheme request for implementation. There's a doc document, and I think it's surfy.org. Is, uh, there's a website if you search for surfies. There's a website where you can see all the surfies that have been submitted, and you can see the ones that have been accepted. There is this process of acceptance, or you know, the uh, not all surfies are you know go through the entire process. And you can also write your own scheme request for implementation. And the idea is to see if there are any implementers of scheme systems who find that requests implement, uh, interesting enough or potentially useful enough that they would like to add it to their system. And often these surfies have uh, you know, reference implementations of the features that they're talking about. And a number of surfies have become standard you know, in scheme implementations. And there are mechanisms in some scheme implementations to load surfies or to you know, add uh, Surfy one extensions, for example, which are, you know, list related extensions from Olin uh, Shivers are sort of like standard list um, related things like, you know, folds or what have you. Okay, so, so the Surfy mechanism is quite interesting. I don't know of another language community that has anything quite like it. You know, partly it's because we don't have big companies driving the development of Scheme. We have a bunch of people who are doing whatever they're doing. And uh, you know, if you want something added to Scheme, well, go through a Surfy and see if people are interested. The The other thing is that, that's interesting about the Surfies is that traditionally a feature ended up in the Scheme report or the standard, if you will, uh, because multiple schemes implemented that feature. So there's a history of not adding features to, or not adding new constructs or libraries or whatever to the scheme report, unless there were implementations that had implemented this already. Um, you know, just because uh, people wanted some experience with these features, they wanted to know you could implement them. I think with R6, there was, you know, maybe more leeway with that. I don't know what it's like for R7, uh, but that was the tradition, I think. And I think for R6, when certain features were proposed, people would try to implement them with their implementations to see how it seemed to work out to aid the discussion. So the, anyway, the Surfy, um, uh, Surfy mechanism, I think is, as far as I know, unique to Scheme. I've never seen anything like that in another language. It's very interesting. Uh, support procedural, syntactic, and data abstraction more fully by allowing programs to define hygien hygiene bending and hygiene breaking syntactic abstractions and new unique data types along with procedures and hygienic macros in any scope. 
Okay, so in the simplest version of uh, like in R five RS, the you know there are these syntax uh, syntax rules macros, and they're also supported in R six. But in R six, at least syntax rules is a special case of a more complicated procedural macro system. And with syntax rules, uh, at least the way you normally write syntax rules, you know your, your your macros in some sense are kind of restricted in terms of playing games with scoping and uh, what they called hygiene bending or you know playing these games with uh ver with identifiers that are used in the macros sometimes it can be handy to do this if for example well i, I won't get into the examples right now but um in in some sense the you know sort of stock syntax rules approach is kind of restrictive unless you play some wild games uh, and then maybe you can get some of the power but the full procedural macro system has additional features that allow you to uh, do some more advanced things with the you know, with the hygiene to, to solve standard problems that come up with these macros. So uh, anyway, so that's in our, our six, uh, it talks about things like syntax case and procedural macros. Uh, you know, the, that's all described in this support in this uh, version of the report and new unique data types. Okay. I don't know if that is talking about the record system. Anyway, that may be the record system. Uh, allow programmers to rely on a level of automatic runtime type and bounds checking sufficient to ensure type system uh, type safety. Uh, I don't know if this is any different from what was in R5. I'm not sure. Allow implementations to generate efficient code without requiring programmers to use implementation specific operations or declarations. I know in some implementations of Lisps you can give hints or declarations for the compiler. And hopefully in Scheme, the idea is that a compiler can, can do a good job. Now there are some features in Scheme that make things tricky. So the combination of call with current continuation with setbang, for example, makes uh, certain classes of optimizations that normally would be admissible, you know, non-safe. Uh, so that's one thing. Let's say as a design, you know, overview, uh, the scheme language is more static than a, a language like Smalltalk. And so Smalltalk is all about extreme late binding everywhere. And scheme, while scheme has lots of flexibility, like you can change the syntax, those sorts of things, you can call a vow. The the design of the language is also set up so that you can, you know, statically tell certain things and you can statically compile your programs efficiently. Um, so it's not as dynamic a language as it could be, but it gives you flexibility through mechanisms like macros. So anyway, so interesting thing where in some sense it feels very dynamic to use the language to me at least, but um, it can be, you know, implemented uh, with an ahead of time uh, compiler in a way that that gives you pretty good performance. So that's something I don't fully understand. By the way, I I uh, probably need more experience with playing around with Smalltalk and the way Smalltalks are implemented versus uh, the way Scheme is compiled. All right. While it was possible to write portable programs in Scheme as described in the R5RS, and indeed portable Scheme programs were written prior to this report. Many Scheme programs were not, primarily because of the lack of substantial standardized libraries and the proliferation of implementation-specific language additions. Well, that's all true. In general, Scheme should include building blocks that allow a wide variety of libraries to be written including commonly used user-level features to enhance portability and readability of library and application code, 
and exclude features that are less commonly used and easily implemented in separate libraries. Okay. The language described in this report is intended to also be backwards compatible, backward compatible with programs written in Scheme as described in R5RS to the extent possible without compromising the above principles and future viability of the language. With respect to future viability, the editors have operated under the assumption that many more scheme programs will be written in the future than exist in the present, so that future programs are those with which we should be most concerned. So this is interesting to me. So they, they decided, well, let's try to keep compatibility with R5 you know, whenever it makes sense. However, uh, we're not going to be beholden to, you know, a complete uh, backwards compatibility for everything. I actually think that's a good decision, partly because R5 RS didn't specify that much. You couldn't write portable code between implementations of Scheme, for example, in R5 RS. And, you know, there wasn't, the, the macro system, I think, wasn't fully fleshed out um, and systems, I think, did things uh, somewhat different ways. So you know, it's not like we had a fully specified language and a whole bunch of implementations and people were used to their code running on all the different implementations without revision. It was a much more free-for-all world for R5. Uh, so you know, I think at least for R6, that made sense. You know, if if there's ever an R10 RS and it decides to break everything in R9 RS, well, maybe that's the wrong decision at that time. But for R6, like, I think that's probably okay, in my opinion. Uh, but we'll see what changed and what breaks. breaks. All right, so we read uh, just over a page. We are on now the top of page four. Um, the acknowledgments, well, we'll get into that uh, in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye.